Hello, everyone. It is great to be here. I have been training for this by watching Donald Trump videos. I'm disappointed to see that none of you have red hats on, but we're going to talk about making object stores great again. I am Steve Lochran. I am, work at Horton Works with these other people, my colleagues. This talk today is about work done by myself, Chris Naroth, and Rajesh Balamohan. I work pretty much full-time these days on object store integration with Hadoop and Spark and HBase and all that stuff. I am the person who is in the middle of those stack traces, you see, okay? Not the bottom bits, not the top bits, the bits in the middle. And I'm really pleased to announce I'm in even more of those stack traces later this year. First, hands up who is using Spark, Apache Spark, talking to object stores of any kind. Okay, hands up Amazon, Amazon S3. Uh, Azure, Microsoft Azure. Nobody. OpenStack. OpenStack. Oh, that's good. I wrote that code. It's not good. Um, Google, Google GCS. Anyone Google? No, they don't test their stuff, actually. Anyway, so Spark in cloud. There's a number of use cases that are emerging. I'm just going to run through how we do that, glue them up. The simplest is kind of elastic ETL. It's a batch job. You spring up a cluster. It's on a set of VMs. You're running HDFS underneath for intermediate storage. Somewhere out there, you have an object store where I think where data's been collected in some random form generated by web logs, by phones, whatever. You want to take that, you want to process it, you clean it up, maybe integrate some other stores, and then you save it into your back end as a more compressed format for processing. ETL, the classic use. Notebooks. The other big one, hands up, he uses notebooks here, notebooks in cloud. Excellent. Nice thing about this is you can bring up a cluster all of your own without anybody interfering with it. You only pay for the hours you're working on it. You can work with all the data stored in external as well as private data sets. And it's nice to have things like a Hive metadata store around there too. And of course, the object stores, sorry, the notebooks save their own state to the cloud as well. So nice, flexible, fun. More cutting edge is actually streaming in this world. Here we have multiple data sources. We can have things like event hubs, Kinesis, that kind of stuff feeding directly in. Alongside things that actually buffer via an object store. This is an example using Azure. We basically, we've ripped out HDFS and running even HBase on top of Azure storage here. This world, you can actually just set Spark up to scan your object store and pull in fresh data. It works pretty well with a few quirks. Now, I want you to all go home with a few concepts from this talk. The key one is object stores are not file systems. You code against them, they pretend they are, but it's a weak metaphor, and every so often it, it breaks horribly, and then you remember, oh, object stores aren't really file systems. Key one is, Data. Data gets kept in hard disks. In HDFS and in object stores, we preserve against disk failure by replicating multiple copies of data. But in a real file system, we have a directory server that actually remembers paths, subdirectories, and then where the data actually lives relative to a file in a subdirectory. What that means is we can do listings on that directory fast, we can delete files fast, we can rename things fast because we're only playing in a directory server. I can rename in a single transacted operation. In contrast, a file, sorry, an object store, they got rid of that directory server. They got rid of the failure point, they got rid of the scale point by saying, we partition the data and we work out where it's going to be based on some hash algorithm of the file name. This is great for resilience, it's really good for certain things. If you know the name of something, it's trivial to find it. Where it's atrocious for is listing things, directory operations, and things like, you know, deleting stuff. And you don't even have a rename. You want to rename something, you have to copy it, then you have to delete it, which is something we'll come back to again and again in this talk, but rename hurts. And more importantly, there is no rename in object stores, but in Hadoop and Spark, we pretend there is. Another big difference of object stores, 
use a REST API to get to them. HTTP calls with authentication in there. You put data up. You do a head to get its metadata. You do a get to retrieve it. If you want to retrieve just a bit of the data, like a seek, you do a get with an offset. And there are kind of list and copy commands as well. It's nice. It's cross-platform. You can write libraries. It's slow, especially if you reopen an HTTPS connection. You've got all the overhead and negotiation and just setting up the communication. And on Amazon, there's load balancing as well. So it's actually measurable even in seconds sometimes. So file systems and object stores are subtly different. However, object stores pretend to be file systems in Spark. And that's because they all implement this API, the Hadoop FS file system API. You, you, are, you give this class, you say, here is my configuration. Here is a URL to a file system. Give me a file system. You get an instance of the class. You can manipulate it. You can list. You can delete. You can read. You can write. However, it's only really designed for things like HDFS and other file systems. We've kind of stuck in without anybody noticing all the other object stores, Azure, S3, OpenStack, those things. Same API, same, almost the same semantics, almost, but very different behaviors when things go wrong. What's hard? Well, basically, the challenge is actually getting it to work, really, more than anything else. That's interesting. They don't have the right font for me here. That was meant to be in felt tip. Never mind. Right. Four problems. Class path credentials, getting your code right, and dealing with the commitment problem. I'm going to just cover S3 and Azure here. The rest follows. So those people working in S3, do you use a URL beginning with just S3 colon at the beginning? S3? S3N? S3N1? Stop at S3A? Are you using S3A? That's the good one. Hadoop Codebase has effectively had three generations of connected to S3, and Amazon forked the second and maintained that one themselves differently. In the ASF, the one you want to use, use S3A URLs. If you're not in the email, use S3A. It's the one that gets maintained. The other ones, we leave them alone because we're scared of breaking something. We know whenever we change something, it'll break, and we just say, we don't touch that, any problem. Come and play with S3A. So embrace S3A. To do that, you are going to, re you're going to absolutely need a version of Hadoop 2.6 jars in your version of Spark. Ideally, you want Spark built with Hadoop 2.7, okay? because that is, we shipped S3A and Hadoop 2.6. We actually got it working by 2.7, and it's only recently been a lot more stuff on scale. If you're getting a copy of Spark off somebody, ourselves, Cloudera, Databricks, whoever, say, has it got the Hadoop 2.7 jars in? And if they say no, you say, well, do that. If you're building Spark up yourself, as you are free to do, you look up Spark 7481, and there's a pull request which actually contains the code that we do to actually package Hadoop jars 2.7 plus, all the Azure and OpenStack and stuff, into Spark, and then runs the integration test. We have a whole suite of integration tests there, too, to say, we've actually got the class path right here. So. Step one, get those classes right. If you're in a notebook, if you're using something like Zeppelin, you can add extra jars to your class path. So you can force this stuff in if it's not there already. But you absolutely have to get the version of the Hadoop jar in sync with everything else you're running. And it's very fussy about the versions of the Java SDK as well. You will get errors if things get wrong. Sorry. And you need your credentials. Object stores, because they're in the cloud, anybody can get at them without authentication, so they care a lot about their authentication. Usually, it comes in the form of some ID and a secret. Your ID is not so important, but your secret access key is absolutely critical. You lose that. You don't just lose access to your data, but there are, there are robots scanning GitHub for AWS credentials just so they can bring up EC2 VMs to do Bitcoin mining. So you'll be bankrupt in hours. Keep that a secret. Don't check it in. You have to get those credentials over to your code, which you can do sticking it in your Spark defaults.conf, relatively straightforward. You can put it in a Hadoop core site. 
if you are actually using Spark Submit to deploy stuff on the command line, you can just set the environment variables because Spark Submit will actually read them and copy them over. So you don't actually need to do it. When you do this, sometimes it will fail. You will get a 403 message. This is where you start getting near my stack traces. Here is my basic checklist of working out what's getting wrong. Probably you've got your credentials wrong, you've misconfigured it. But actually, step one we have is actually making sure that the version of Joda time on the class path and the JVM version are consistent. If you have a version of Joda time 2.80 or earlier, it just doesn't work. And that's, that's kind of annoying, because that thing, that can regress if you're not careful. Anyway, that out of the way, it'll be your credentials wrong, they're not propagating. Or if you're playing with VMs, your clock is horribly wrong. You have to sign stuff with the time. If your clock's wrong, somebody's nodding over there. You've been there, is that right? Yeah. Anyway, never trust your clock. So let's imagine it all works. We're all happy now. It's time to get coding. And the answer is, you code with it the way you've seen every other example today. You just use the URL to that object store in your code. Here's me trying to read a CSV file. I say S3A. Landsat PDS, which is the bucket, and scenelist.gz. This is actually a real file. It's Amazon publish a vast portfolio of Landsat satellites. This is the CSV file, which actually indexes it. It's a nice test file because Amazon paid for the bandwidth. So I can just read it in. I just say, right, I'm going to read this into a Spark context. It's got a header file. Go and, go and work out the schema, and if there's something wrong, fail. So infer your schema is going to read through it twice. It's a 20, gig, 20, 20 meg file, so it takes a bit of time. But it just reads it all in happily for you. The time to read it in is going to depend on how far away. If you're remote, it's going to take time. If you're in Amazon's EPU infrastructure and it's hosted on the same site as where your clouds are, it's going to be relatively fast. So you've read your CSV file in. What do you can do next? The answer is, we want to transform it into a file we can do real work on. You want to save it into something binary where you can do fast queries on it. That means orc, parquet, something like that. Here, I've got a different bucket now. I'm just saying, right, save it to there. Again, I just write to it. Then, been written to new object store, I can read it back in. Say, right, now I have data frames. I've read it back in. Parquet and orc, all ready to play with. And it just looks like any other data source. I can now do SQL queries on it. For some reason, some of those files, some of those Landsat images come back with a negative cloud cover, which is weird, because it should be a percentage from 0 to 100. So one of the bits of cleanup you do when you're extracting it is to say, let's find out how many clouds were below zero. Cut them out. You can use data frames to do that. This is absolutely critical to get decent performance, is embracing data frames. Because it can, not only can it reorder the queries to make things more efficient, it can actually push the predicates down to the code base so that Orc and Parquet can do the filtering analysis. And it just means that they reduce the amount they need to fetch. If you filter on the columns, you say, I only want these columns, you say, here are the filters, that stuff will go all the way down to the file layout and will read in less data. Even so, I should warn you, it's going to be slow. If you are reading the same data in again and again, one, think about playing with the cache button. Two, consider copying it to HGFS in your cluster, and then you just use an HGFS URL. Just because once things are in HGFS, they are stored on three machines inside a little transient cluster, so you're going to get local disk I.O. with those systems and multiple places where it will be. So you will get better bandwidth. Here are the recommended settings right now, as of this week, that I would recommend for reading this data. This comes from my colleague, Rajesh, who spent a lot of time doing benchmarks of the TCP DS, benchmarks on various EC2 VMs. You basically want, for Parquet, you want filter pushdown. You want predicate pushdown. And the other two options, merge schema and summary, basically say, do not read or write extra data while you do this. Orc is pretty similar. You want to push stuff down. You say include the footer means pass all the footer metadata around with my query rather than rereading it. And there's something to do with striping that just is a performance tuning. The other thing is you tell Hive to try and partition its metadata. 
I could go into partitioning in depth, but I won't bother, but just say it, it matters because directory listing is so atrocious in object stores. So you do that, you've got your performance data frames really, that's all you need to go. And at that point, you can use your code, you can also work with it in notebooks too. Here is Zeppelin, I'm just using Python, same, same URL to S3A, I say go and read it and it comes in. Object stores are almost like file systems in your code. Almost. There is one little problem, the final of the C's commitment, where if you're doing work, suddenly you notice that at the end of any operation, everything just seems to sit there for a minute. It's just sitting, twiddling your thumbs. You're going, why is it taking so long? What's happening? Where is it? You look in the logs and it goes something about, oh, finish and commit, and then there's a pause about 20 seconds. It goes, oh, we've committed. And the problem is, is that the code that Spark currently uses at the end of an operation to commit data does a rename. The reason for that is to do with speculation and failure. All the, all the executors, they write to a temporary file, subdirectory, under the final destination directory. When they finished, when they say, right, I'm ready, I've completed, and no other speculative job has completed ahead of me, I rename in. And that rename, on a real file system, it gives you that exclusive lock, it guarantees that you've won and nobody else has got in there. That's really good on a file system because it's instantaneous. On object store, it absolutely dies because your time to rename on S3 is about six megabytes a second. So the more data you have in, the longer it gets. That kind of sucks. One thing I recommend you do is you copy in these really, really long numbers here. Don't write it down, the slides will be up later. But basically you say use version two of the algorithm, which still does lots of renaming, but less than version one. Skip some of your cleanup, because you can, if you can. And turn speculation off because it just, you're going to create race conditions that things can't handle. Now, at this point, I'm sure some of the people in the audience are going, oh, no, no, direct output committers, we use direct committers, which is this thing that's existed for a while to deal with this problem, which actually says, I don't bother doing a write, then I rename, I just write straight to that file name and all is well. And all is well until things go horribly wrong, at which point you either have lost or corrupt data, and what's worse, you may have lost or corrupt data that you don't realize. And that's the scariest one of all. So there was one by Databricks in one of their jars. There is one in Spark 1.6, and there are zero in Spark 2, and that was got pulled. And if you have speculation enabled, the code Spark will even look and say, does the name of the commit I've requested have the word direct in it? And if so, it tells you off and ignores you because it's just too dangerous. That's the year it's been turned off. You can go and follow it, and there are lots of people saying, hey, this is gone, bring it back. And other people are going, hey, it's gone, we can't. One of my bits of homework is to try and make something like this better again, something we can bring back, okay? We can do it, it's just going to take work. What my colleagues have been doing first, though, is making things fast, making input fast, making output fast, making output scale. If you get a future version of Hadoop 2.8, we might cut soon. That will spark built on that. If you grab HDP 2.5, which you can download today, and if there's anybody in the cl from Cloudera here, they might point to a future version of Cloudera, CDH, we've spent a lot of time really benchmarking and tuning S3A performance. And that benchmarking and tuning has actually been done in Spark and Hive. We've gone through and said, oh, what's going on? And how many, what's happening? Why are there so many HTTPS connections being taken up and breaking down, just trying to minimize everything millimeter by millimeter. And we have done it for some really, you know, some pretty impressive numbers. We believe now we are significantly faster than Amazon's EMR from reading data of S3. I say believe, I think I need to do some more benchmarks before you can actually trust it, but we're getting some pretty good numbers. One of the key things is we're just stopping breaking HTTP connections. It used to be I read a bit of data, did a seek, read a bit, seek a bit, read a bit of data, and we're permanently closing and reopening HTTP connections. No, no, we just read ahead, say, I'm going to read ahead a megabyte rather than breaking and reopening a connection. And you can also say this F advice thing says, read in small blocks, and we can seek backwards and forwards really efficiently. It's 
very bad for going all the way through something like a gzip file, but for things like Park and Orca, it's fantastic. So, as soon as you get a copy of Spark with the right underlying libraries, you will want to turn these features on. That's S3. The other currently big, although significantly less big, object store is Microsoft Azure. Was B is the URL. Its jars come in Hadoop Azure, and Azure Storage 2.2 is the jar. All its other dependencies come for free and bundled in Spark Home anyway. Again, it's got a set of credentials. You need a very long hex key that you stick in core site or Spark default. That gives you an account name like example blob core. Then you use the container, which actually uses the username, demo app, followed by that thing there. WASB is actually faster than S3. It's more consistent. Microsoft even published papers telling you how it works. It doesn't quite scale to so big. If any of you want to store a couple of petabytes in a single container, it's not going to work, whereas in contrast, S3 does scale better. But for most of us, it's irrelevant. And yeah, it does rename quite nicely, actually. Anyway, so here is that example I was talking about streaming. It just looks like a data source. I basically now say, right, I'm going to create a streaming context. Use a WASB URL, create my little streaming mapper here. And here I'm saying every time a new line comes in, print it. And then I just start my streaming off. That will permanently, every 10 seconds, it'll be looking in that file path to say, have any new files arrived? If the new files that I haven't processed in that window, hand them off for processing. And it's all done. Anyone use Spark streaming scanning files in HGFS or other file system? Hands up? Nobody, OK. If you are using a local file system, you absolutely mustn't write into the file system while you're actually writing the files, because what happens is Spark streaming goes, oh, there is a file here of 0 bytes or 10 bytes. Process it. Your downstream code says, hang on, this is empty or incomplete, and gets into a mess. So the, the, the rule there is always you write to someone your file system, and then to actually get it picked up, you do a rename as soon as you've closed it. In an object store, you don't need to bother with that because the file isn't actually visible so it's been fully written. So you just write straight into destination. What you will find, though, is listing the directory gets slow, so actually you can't use small windows. You can't say, I'm going to scan every second, every two seconds. Actually, you're going to need longer windows. And even there, to keep it under control, you need to keep the number of files on that directory down. So reasonable size window, you can put straight into it, but you have to clean things up as you go along. Anyway, that is the core concepts here. I could go into terrifying depth about some of the things that we do have to deal with, but it's probably best, if you're, if you're not working in this area, to not worry about it right now. If you are doing working with S3 or WASB at scale, then you will have to worry about it. You can come and find me down at the Hortonworks booth or around at the conference for the rest of the rest of the conference. Key thing to know is, especially on S3, Amazon throttles you under load. If you have a big cluster and you keep on trying to hit Amazon S3, Amazon S3 will say, hey, you're asking me too many questions and slow you down. And what's fun here is it throttles you based on your file names. So you actually have to start choosing file and directory names to try and defeat Amazon's own actual throttling algorithms. And what's better, Amazon don't document what this file name throttling algorithm logic is. So we're still trying to work out through trial and error. Okay? But what it does mean is all the normal standard rules are saying, oh, you want to lay out your data by year, month, day, whatever, is absolutely not the right thing to do in this world. We just don't have a really good answer. Anyway, that is a very quick overview of the stuff you need to do working with object stores. Key thing is, it's just another URL of data to work with. You're getting an object store. It's not quite a file system. It looks the same. It pretends the same until things go horribly wrong. You've got a whole new set of class path problems to deal with. You've got credentials, which you had better not share with anybody. 
And to get all this stuff to work, you need to get Hadoop 2.7 or later on your class path. I've stuck some hints up there as to Spark default options to really get the best performance from this. They'll be on the slides later. In this Spark 7481 patch I'm trying to get pulled in, I've actually got a whole document to go with this too, actually. So I do try and write this stuff down. And finally, have fun out there, really. If you do see a stack trace, I would like to apologize. It probably is my code. We are making things better. One thing that I'm actually going to be working on when I get home on Friday is working on a project with some people in Cloudera and someone from HST called S3 Guard, C Guard, where to get the consistent atomic rename, we're actually going to be using Amazon Dynamo as a directory server. So we'll be keeping our data in S3, but using Dynamo to say, I can do atomic operations because they'll get rejected if there's already an entry of that name in there. So it gives a consistency and atomicity. So that, that is the goal, to have this working by the end of the year so we can finally do fast renames at the end of the operation. Ultimately, you want to say, I can actually work with Amazon S3 just as if it is the, the final store of all data. Now, we have actually come in ahead of schedule with some questions. I will point out I'm also going to be at ApacheCon, which ASF, Apache Software Foundation, would love for me to attend, which is in Seville, two weeks' time. Do come and have fun with everybody, because people across the entire Hadoop, Apache, Hive, Spark, everything code base will be there. And you can heckle them. Otherwise, who has any questions now? Thank you for sharing those words of wisdom. Um, did you take the slide out that had your error message in it? No, we won't go there. Uh, do we have any questions? There are two mics at the end of um, the aisle. Please feel free. We've got about three and a half minutes. We have a volunteer. Oh, yeah. Gentleman on the right. Um, I have a question regarding checkpointing in Spark streaming to S3 or SVA. Do you have any comment on this? Oh, or I haven't tried that. <laughs> I haven't okay. tried that at all. Um, to be honest, the stuff I've been doing with Spark streams, I've been using it as an input source rather than a destination. Okay, if we're playing in Azure, because it looks like a real file system with locks and leases, it doesn't have so many problems. And I think the other use case is that, oh, you write to HGFS or something like that. I have not been using S3 as a destination for this stuff. Okay. Okay, so that's not really a good answer, is it? No, sorry. <laughs> well, what do you think? What did, it work? did it work for you? It works, but it's quite of slow, so... Could be the rename thing again, actually. Yeah, I, th I thought thing of the rename thing, so that might be some reason. If you can grab the Hadoop 2.8 binaries, we've added a lot more instrumentation of what's going on. We've got metrics for pretty much every operation, bytes written, renames, operations deleted, all that kind of stuff. And all you do is with the file system handle, you just print it, you log it, and it just dumps out all this stats. Okay, so you really can get a better idea of what's going on, and then... It won't Thank fix you. your problems, but you know at least where to begin to start trying to <laughs> diagnose them. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, if you don't have them, give a big hand to Steve Logram from Hortonworks. Thank you.